you're up. We're good. Good morning, New City. Welcome, you guys. Isn't today a beautiful morning? Oh my goodness. Nice and warm compared to last Sunday. Got some sunshine. It's good to see your smiling faces. We're going to get started with some worship on this Palm Sunday. And I'm excited for our worship and celebration today. You guys should know this first one. It talks about Jesus being our lion and our lamb. That um, he's our lamb who was sacrificed for us, but he's our lion who fights our battles for us. And uh, so let's worship God together.
power fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our God is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you so much. Thank you for this time that we get to come and worship you. And uh, we thank you that for those who are joining us online and those who are here in person. Uh, we, we're just so glad um, to be in your presence together, to be um, here together, unified in spirit and in your presence. And so we just invite you into the rest of this time and pray that you would bless it. Pray that we would see more of who you are, God, and that we'd be changed by that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We're going to take a couple minutes just to say hi. Say hi to the people around you. Give them a wave or a fist bump or whatever. And I will come back with some announcements in just a couple minutes. this way, Trevor, so I'm going to probably do the same. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm turning off him to give you, like, all the more, just, this, this stage is yours, like, in, in the That's how you want your, your music stand? Uh, I think so. I guess I should do that before I start pitching. I think that one's extended pretty much, but you get another extension up on the top here where your hand is. Thanks. I like it high so that I can see it well. Yeah. So when you had it before, I was like, I don't even know what you're going to do. Stay together. Cool. Like, like Alex. <laughs> the sun will move, so if you want your cast to walk, the thing will start to, the shadow will start to shift. Shifting shadows. Shifting shadows. So, Wait, so like you'll want to stand here mm -hmm. right now. As your sermon goes on, you'll want to get to the right, <laughs> get closer and closer to it. Yeah.
Good morning, New City. I love watching you guys connect with each other. It's a good view from right where I'm at. We're going to do some announcements here. For any of you New City parents um, who haven't gone to the children's table just beyond this beautiful tree over there, um, Katie has some rocks that she's giving out and she's doing a cool project where um, the kids are going to um, do something on the rocks. So if you haven't done that, go talk to Katie over there and pick up your rocks. Um, we got Good Friday coming up. Yeah. And I am so excited, guys. You do not want to miss this. Uh, the Carbo Hall's house is beautiful, and they have a wonderful backyard where we're going to have different stations um, kind of spread out, so very COVID safe. And um, each station, we're just trying to have it be like this fun experience. And I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be a good time. Uh, some specific details with that is uh, it's going to happen from 6 to 8 o'clock. Um, so it's kind of a spread out time there. But if you have kids, um, if you can try to come in the, in the time zone of a 6 to 7, because that's where we'll have child care provided, um, there'll be a nearby park that's just walking distance, and we'll have some people uh, watching um, the children to allow you to come and gain your own uh, personal experience. Good Friday and, and meditation without um, having to meditate on your kids. Um, so, yeah, so, again, Good Friday from 6 to 8. If you're a parent, you want to be thinking 6 to 7. Um, you can RSVP. Uh, you need to RSVP to find out um, the location specifically and also it, we need to know uh, we need to do it RSVP style anyway so if you go up to our, our new city welcome table right there hey Liz can you raise your hand how do you like our fancy table over there yeah so that's where you can RSVP yep there it is that's your RSVP for Good Friday yep so please do that thanks Liz for the uh, like uh, I think of like Price is Right or something when they're doing the thing. Um, also, uh, speaking of Good Friday, we have, uh, we're still doing an invite. We do have all our adult artists lined up for, for Good Friday, but we do have this, uh, we do want to do the last, uh, what do you call it, last station to be kids artwork, which is going to be really cool, and it's on Jesus' burial. Um, if your kid is at all an artist, even if they're kind of not, it's still cute no matter what. But uh, we would love any kid that wants to participate into um turning in artwork for Good Friday. So that's kind of like the last call to artists is now we have all our adult artists, which is yay. It's going to be awesome. And then, uh, but we do would love some more kid artwork um, and it's on the burial. And if uh, you are interested, please either come up to the table and we can email you um, kind of the verse and the thought on the, on the burial thing. And uh, we would love to see what your kids can do. We do already have a few kids, but we want some more. Um, last thing is uh, Easter. So we got Good Friday this Friday, and then we have Easter this Sunday. Yeah. 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 Woo um, <laughs> and we're going to have an egg hunt. So um, s spread the news that we're going to have an egg hunt to, um, you know, people who maybe even don't go to church. Um, I think they like egg hunts. I like egg hunts. And because I also like egg hunts, uh, not just for that reason, but I think uh, I think uh, we're going to do an adult egg hunt as well. So um, for any of you guys that are a kid at heart, uh, like myself, we're doing an egg hunt for both for kids and adults. And yeah. so I think that's about it for announcements. Um, I am just going to hand it over to Pastor Vince here, do a quick prayer for him. God, we just invite you to this space. And we ask that you now would um, direct our attention uh, to you and open our minds to to learn something more about you the knowledge of you is what we are designed for so we ask that uh, we would work according to our design and so we thank you so much for what you're going to show us today and we pray that you would speak through vince right now in your name amen good morning everybody happy palm sunday my name is Vince, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here. Stoked to be walking through the original Palm Sunday story this morning. We're going to be in Mark chapter 11. Um, while you're turning there, uh, I'll just say, isn't this about the best place in the world you can meet right now on a day like this? It's gorgeous, man, the trees. we um, I love these pine trees. We have some of these trees up in uh, the property we just bought. There's all this greenery around our home, but it's never enough for my lovely wife, Nancy. There has to be greenery all inside the home as well. She's the houseplant queen. 
and uh, the other day she came back with a new house plant and uh, I feel like we are actually adulting as millennial couple because we finally have a fiddle leaf fig tree in our house. How many of you guys have fiddle leaf fig trees? I hipsters unite. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, it's a, it's a fig tree. Uh, where's the figs? She said, what? I said, where's the fruit? She said, it doesn't have figs. It's pretty. <laughs> what? What is that? And then I felt really condescending. Like, why would we buy a tree that's supposed to be a fruit tree that doesn't have fruit on it? And I read this story and I realized how like Jesus I am. So Mark chapter 11, <laughs> verse 12. We're going to start in the middle of the chapter and then we're going to jump around a bit. Mark 11, verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find any fruit on it. And when he came to it, he found nada, nothing, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard it. All right, this is the word of God. Father, bless this time today, I pray you'd speak to us. Open our hearts to hear your voice. Open our minds to receive what you want to say to us today. We love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and ask him, where are your figs? <laughs> so this is probably the most pivotal chapter in the entire gospel of Mark, possibly no other chapter gives us a clearer window into our own soul. At the beginning of the chapter, people are ready to crown Jesus, waving palm branches, and by the end of the chapter, they're plotting to murder him. Why? What changed? What could cause such a drastic 180 degree flip around murder a, a rabbi who tells stories and heals people you want to you want to kill him? he's a good man right and these people these people are supposed to be good religious moral people too and yet how quickly they shift their heart shifts what why and right in the middle of this chapter of these two whirlwind action sequences that we're going to explore lies this seemingly random story we just read about a fig tree like what what the heck is going on here what if i told you that this fig tree is the key to unlocking the mystery of this entire chapter and discovering why people change their response so drastically why they exchanged crowning him as king and placing him on a throne to crowning him with thorns and placing him on a cross. This story explains the fickleness of the human heart that if we're honest today, lies within all of our hearts and how seemingly good moral religious people can go from crowning to crucifying their savior. And that same key We'll speak to you and I in profound ways today if, if you'll let it. So don't miss it because if, if you miss this, you could mis misunderstand the heart of the king and the hope of the kingdom. And as life happens to you and seasons show up in life like this past season that we all just went through, you'll find yourself unfruitful, unfulfilled, frustrated, burnt out overwhelmed by life, maybe even bitter and resentful, confused and picking apart your faith and trying to figure out what's missing. You could end up missing out on the entire heart of the gospel and what God wants to do in your life. So what is the mystery of the fig tree? And why does that sound like a Hardy Boys novel? And what, what might that mystery lead us to discover about ourselves and about God today? You guys ready? Let's rewind the tape. 24 hours earlier is the beginning of the chapter, Mark 11, and Jesus and his disciples are heading to Jerusalem for Passover. 
And it says in verse 1, As they approached Jerusalem and neared Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a young donkey there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So these disciples, they go to the village, they get the donkey, they bring it to Jesus, they cover it with their coats, and Jesus climbs up on its back and begins riding towards Jerusalem. And as he's riding from a distance, people see him and they start to respond. Look at verse eight. So many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread palm branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead of those uh, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Th this is the original Palm Sunday and it is an awesome action-packed moment this is not your average royal entry though is it like i mean jesus is heading towards a potential coronation on the back of a donkey this is very different from what we're used to here in the west you, you guys anybody disney kids did you watch aladdin growing up as he goes into the city prince ali fabulous he ali ababa He's got 75 golden camels. He's got the monkeys. We want the monkeys, right? This is, we're used to those kinds of processions and here's Jesus on a donkey. Seems a bit underwhelming at first to our Western eyes. But to these first century Jews, this moment is loaded with meaning because see the donkey he's riding is an old prophetic symbol of humility and peace and this moment is, is it's, it's it loaded with meaning for them because it embodies the promise of the Old Testament that years spent in captivity under foreign powers, these people have held on to the hope that one day our Savior will come. And this moment, this moment fulfills all those years of awaited prophecy like for instance, Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you, righteous and victorious and lowly and riding on a donkey. So this moment is just, it's loaded, right? Jesus rides into the city. This scene is pregnant with promise. The entire city stops and gathers around the commotion. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the king we've been longing for, our Messiah, the one who's going to make everything right, finally. He's come to fulfill our hopes and deliver our dreams. He's going to free us from all the injustice of the world. Can you imagine? It's, I mean, they can't wait. He's going to overthrow those stinking Romans and he's going to let us worship in the temple the way we want. Everything we have longed for and prayed for and begged God for, it's finally here. Embodied in this guy on a donkey. But here's the problem. They struggle with the same thing a lot of us struggle with especially in years like 2020, where the world seems to be falling apart last year and pandemics ripping through our world and politics and all, all the things are going crazy. And you, you hear people say, where's God? They struggled with what theologians refer to as an over-realized eschatology. You say, well, what the heck is that? Let me explain. See, Jesus is the savior who's bringing all these things. He's gonna deliver heaven on earth. He's gonna take their sorrow and give them joy. He's gonna take their oppression and bring freedom. He's gonna take their poverty and pour out the riches of heaven. Jesus is the king bringing all these things one day. But today's not that day. Today he's bringing, and, and they would never believe this, he's actually bringing something far better. But they're going to miss it because of their expectations. Their expectations of him are not in align with kingdom reality. They're more in love with their idea of what he's going to do for them than they are actually in love with him 
himself. Uh, here's an example of this. Uh, if you saw a, a guy marry a gal, and um, she's wealthy from a wealthy family, and they're married for a little while, and her father passes away, and all of a sudden, she realizes she's not getting anything from the will. And the next morning she wakes up and this dude's gone, his bags are packed. That's messed up, right? And what, what would you say? He married her for the what? Yeah, for the money. She's not an end in herself. She was a means to some other end. He was using her to get something he wanted. Well, you know what? It's the same thing with so many of us. A lot of us have married God for his money. We've seen God as a means to some other end. Blessings, eternal life, your best life now, whatever it might be. Let me ask you, as we're, as we're getting going here, what expectations have you put on God? And here's the problem. You, you know what they say, all conflict flows from unmet expectations. Have you heard that? All these expectations that these people have of God, what he's going to do for them, when he's going to do it for them, are brewing beneath the surface of all their hosannas. And there's this enormous amount of conflict just waiting to erupt. And these people in this moment are completely blind to their own hearts. See, they don't understand the tension and the nuance and the wisdom of God's plan in human history. They don't comprehend that Jesus is coming to inaugurate his kingdom that one day will be consummated. They don't grasp the fact that he has a plan to eradicate evil and bring justice and heal sickness and conquer death forever, but he's not going to do it by slaughtering the Romans and climbing up on Caesar's throne. He's going to be slaughtered by the Romans and climb up on a cross. And instead of punishing sin, he will become sin and be punished. And instead of bringing judgment, he will bear judgment. And instead of being healed, he'll purchase our healing with the wounds in his own body. And three days later, he'll conquer death once and for all, giving us this ultimate hope of true, abundant, eternal life forever with him, where there will be no more sickness and no more COVID and no more poverty and no more pain and no more sorrow where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Jesus is in the middle of doing something at a, at a mind melting cosmic scale something so enormous that in this moment these people can't even begin to grasp it something that will prepare the way for that eventual day that they're longing and praying for and, and that's what i mean by an overrealized eschatology jesus is at work inaugurating his kingdom that one day he will return and consummate but they want it all and they want it now they want dessert without eating dinner. They want the promises without the process to get there. They want the kingdom of God without the cross. They want resurrection life forever without suffering and death. They want eternal life. They want heaven without the king as he truly is. And here's the thing today, as I look at my own heart, I realize I did the same thing. Maybe you do too. I, I'll, I'll explain one way I do it. I prefer to be in control of my life. I think I know what I need when I need it. And when God's plan doesn't line up with my plan, like the entire year we just came through, I question God instead of my own heart or my own plan. But if Jesus is king, and if the Bible's true, he has the best plan. He knows what's best ultimately for me and for the world and for the glory of God. I love the way Tim Keller says it. He says, God will always give you exactly what you would pray for if you knew everything he knows. You believe that? I want to ask you, I want you to not just answer out loud, I want you to answer in your heart of hearts right now. Do you believe that God loves you and cares about you? Right now, do you believe that he has a plan in all this for your ultimate good?
that everybody else in the world might be going through broken stuff too in this fallen world, but that God promises to work all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you, do you believe that? And I know it can be hard to believe that sometimes, especially when he does things that seem so confusing. For instance, look at, look at what Jesus does next. Jesus it arrives in the center of the city and people are going nuts. Every eye is on him. He steps down from the donkey onto the crunch of palm leaves and he walks into the temple and he looks around and he takes it all in. And he just turns around and leaves. Seriously, look at verse 11. Look at, so Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple and after looking around carefully at everything, he left. Seems kind of anticlimactic, Jesus. Like, doesn't it? I mean, this is his moment. He's missing his moment. They're ready to crown him and put him on a throne. And he just looks around and leaves. Well, what's he see? He sees the temple. And he sees what the temple represented. And in order to understand what's happening here, you have to understand what the temple represented in the collective psyche of the first temple Jewish culture. It was a lot more than just a nice church building, right? The original temple, you guys know about this probably, but Solomon had built it. And, and the Bible records that Solomon had gathered so much gold. He had gathered 100,000 talents of gold, which equals 7.5 million pounds of gold. That's more than the USA has in Fort Knox in this temple. And about 400 years before Jesus, the Babylonians had come in and they had decimated Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and carted all that gold off away to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And the children of Israel wept by the rivers of Babylon, missing Zion and saying, why, why did we allow this to happen? And do you guys, do you know why that had happened? Why, why had God allowed these foreign countries to come in and conquer Israel and destroy the temple? Well, they had, they had turned from worship of the true God to the worship of idols. And God, God's like, our covenant's like a marriage covenant. I love you. I want what's best for you. But you're like my wife who's going around and sleeping with all kinds of other dudes. Like, if, they, if those gods are what you want, you can have them. I'll, I'll remove myself from the picture. So he, God pulls back his protection and his provision and says, if that's what you want, you can have them. And these foreign powers come in and wipe out Israel. And they weep and they cry for hundreds of years. Man, if we could just get back, if we could get the temple back up and running, man, yeah, we would be holy. We would be pure. We would get rid of all the false idols in our life. We would just worship God with everything that we had. You ever prayed like that? Hey, God, if you'll just do this thing in my life, then, like, if you could just fix this relationship, or if you could give me that raise, or me, 12 years old, on the roller coaster, God, if you'll get me off this roller coaster, I'll go to China, I'll be a missionary. I'll get rid of all my worldly CDs. <laughs> What's a CD? <laughs> Thanks, Kenny. And now they have it, like Herod the Tetrarch in the time of Jesus, when he was a baby, one of the world's greatest ever architects had rebuilt the temple finally. And it's not exactly like Solomon's temple, but man, it is a point of pride in their culture. And this temple, it's not just a house of worship, it represents, like if you could combine the United States Congress and Harvard and Wall Street and the Statue of Liberty all into one thing, you'd have some kind of idea what the temple represented to their culture. It's, a, it's this loaded, beautiful religious thing. And to these people who have been captives by foreign powers and beat down and enslaved and robbed of their dignity, it's far more than a temple. It was a picture of salvation. When everything else in my life is falling apart, I have this to keep me going. When you're having a bad day, you could look up to the center of the city and sigh one day. One day it won't always be like this. This temple represented the hope they were holding on to. It was actually by Jesus' time sort of functioning as a savior. 
So whatever you do, don't mess with my temple. And Jesus steps into that temple and he lets the full weight of the moment hit him. And then he turns around and leaves and leaves the crowd completely confused and bewildered. And he walks back to Bethany to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and he goes to sleep. And the next day, as he returns to the temple in Jerusalem, on the road from Bethany, Jesus encounters this fig tree that we read about. Now, when you hear this preached, which maybe I should say when I heard this preached growing up, it kind of went something like this. Jesus was hungry. He was hangry. He sees a fig tree with no fruit, so he curses it. Moral of the story, you won't like him when he's hangry. Or God hates figs. Or it's something, you know, it's like, I, what is the deal with this story? Every time I've heard this, it seemed like this story is kind of completely out of place in the narrative. Random, and Jesus seems so, like, angry and testy. But the context of this story and the history surrounding it shows that it goes so much deeper. I mean, think about this. Jesus is on his way to the temple. And the fig tree, fig tree in, in first century Judaism re represents, it's a symbol of Israel and Jewish spiritual leadership and authority. So the minor prophets, all of them from Hosea, Joel, Amos, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, they all refer to the fig tree as a type for Israel's spiritual leadership. Jesus is on his way to the city. And he's going to declare essentially that the temple is irrelevant. And on his way, he curses a fig tree, the symbol of the Jewish religious establishment. If you go around cursing the symbol of the Jewish religious establishment, the religious establishment isn't really gonna go for that. What does Jesus do on his way to the city? He burns the flag. This is a loaded religious social gesture. If you're a disciple, you'd be like, oh, dang, it's like an epic rap battle. And Jesus just dropped the mic. I mean, whoa, he curses a fig tree. Cursing a fig tree could get you killed. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that a, a fig tree without fruit is useless to a hungry person, Nancy. Just like the temple system that didn't bear spiritual fruit was useless to the world. He's saying that something about what's coming. He's saying this entire system is going down. Why? Because the temple had turned from being God-centered to pushing God out of the center. Instead of representing God, it had replaced God. And what their ancestors had done years before by worshiping all these false gods outside their religion, now they were doing by setting up false gods in the name of their religion. They'd gone from living immorally to living moralistically. They'd gone from living lasciviously to living legalistically. They'd gone from living like the prodigal son in the parable to the prodigal older brother. And maybe their behavior seemed better on the outside. The optics were good. They were respectable, they were moral, but the same root sin lurked deep within. They wanted the blessings of God without God himself. They married God for his money. And they took the gifts of God and worshiped them instead of him. And they're, they're breaking God's heart. The temple system had become an idol a belief system that had them thinking that they could control God. If I do this many sacrifices, then God has to forgive me. He has to bless me. If I live a pure moral life, prayer, fasting, worship, then he has to restore us. He has to restore Israel. If I pay my tithes, then I'll get the good parking spot at the mall. If this than that. They, in other words, their relationship with God wasn't a loving, heartfelt relationship anymore. It was just a series of transactions. It was all about them. God was just a means to the end that they really loved in his place. Are we tracking? How's that happen? How does something as wonderful and God-given as the temple, something centered on God that was an avenue for God to bless his people, how has it changed so much? 
How, why? Why have they stopped looking to God as the source of their blessing and perverted and twisted and warped the system in order to extract their own blessings in their own way? Well, it happens all the time, doesn't it? God gives us good things and we turn them into God things and we worship them instead of him. That's why John Calvin famously said that the human heart is an idol factory. We take good things all the time that God gives us. God, think about the things that God's blessed you with. Just start a list in your mind, all the blessings of God, your relationships, your jobs, your money and property. You have time, you have ex experiences and food and clothes and opportunity and drink and sex and all these blessings. These, those are good things. They're meant to be ways of experiencing God's goodness and grace in tangible ways in your life and placing our affection and our hope and our trust more fully in him, but inevitably what happens. We end up letting our eyes focus on the gifts more than the giver. It would be like this, fellas. Imagine you find the love of your life and you buy that ring and you get down on your knee and you propose to her. And she says, yes. Hopefully, if she says no, you're not at a stadium full of people. She says yes, and you give her the ring, and she loves the ring, right? And then all of a sudden, you notice like a month later, she's not really talking to you that much, and her hair is starting to get gray and wiry, and her skin's turning gray, and she talks in the third person, and she says, my precious. She's turning into Smeagol. <laughs> Why? Because she forsakes the giver, in lieu of the gift. This gift that's meant to bring you closer ends up being the thing that comes between you. Why? Because you aren't the center of her affections anymore. And that's exactly what we do with God, isn't it? It's what I do with God all the time. And honestly, we rarely notice it. We have so many blind spots, we hardly even realize. He gives us good things and we turn them into ultimate things and they become our focus in place of him. What are some examples? Let's, let's dialogue for a quick second. What are some examples of good things that we uh, are blessed with by God? A job. And what, what are some of the things we get from a job? Money. Provision, right? What else? Status. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Health insurance. Security. Yeah, yeah. All kinds of stuff. I'll tell you the story briefly. I remember, and you could go down a list, right, of all kinds of blessings that God's given us. But let me throw one out to you from my life. I remember we moved into downtown to start a church. It's me and Nancy, and I, I got to get a job down there because we had been living in East County. This is, oh my Lord, like 12 years ago. And and we moved down there, and I'm like, man, this is it's all right. It's going to work out. I've never had a problem getting a job. I'll get a job in downtown. We got plenty in savings. Three, uh, three or four, four months later, savings is almost gone. I have beat the pavement with resumes all over the place, no job. What is going on? I'm getting frustrated with God. Hey, wait, I we sold our place and we moved down here to an apartment to do your work and you can't even hook me up with a job here, God? I'm running out of money. I'm starting to get frustrated. I'll never forget this moment happened and I, you may have heard me share it before, but it was a pivotal moment, so I gotta share it today. We get this phone call and it's on a day when rent's due the next day. It was the third of the month, you know, that final day when rent's due and we were exactly a thousand short. And I'm stressed. I'm like, I, I, I'm trying to come up with other plans. I'm beyond frustrated. We get a call and it's uh, from this girl who had been at our church for a while. She had, um, she wasn't a Christian, but she had gotten in a really tough relationship. And so Nancy and I had created some space in our home for her taking her in, taking care of her. She needed benevolence. We gave her like 500 bucks from the church for benevolence. And then she came to church like two Sundays. That was it. And then she was gone. Her friends were on a road trip back to Seattle and she was gone on the road trip. And it's like, well, hey, that's what we're here to do. Be hands and feet and love people. And 
you know, one plants, one waters, God gives the increase, but let it go. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I get a phone call. Hey guys, I'm in town. I want you to meet my husband. Your husband? What? It's been like six months. What are we talking about? Dude, I want to, I want to meet him. Yeah, absolutely. So we go down, we hang out and I meet this guy and he starts crying. And he grew up as a, as a minister's kid and thanked us because his wife had come to faith and he loved her and, and it, he was like just over the moon. And we're like, she came to faith? On which one of the two Sundays? I didn't know that. That's awesome. And so is this really touching moment we're hanging out for a bit. At the end, they give us two envelopes. One says the church and then the other says Vince and Nancy. So we go back towards our apartment and we open the first one to the church and it's $500 bills to pay the church back for the benevolence. And we open up the second envelope and this is the only time this has ever happened in my life, but it was enough, believe me. There were 10 $100 bills in it. And I'll never forget just leaning back against one of those giant planters in the courtyard and looking up at the sky and Nancy and we, we both had tears coming out of our eyes. And in that moment, I'll never forget how clearly I felt God say to me, Vince, I am your provider. I'm the source of your security. I'm the source of everything. It's not your job. You're asking me for a job. It's not your job. Now, you might have a job. That's just a means, but I'm the source. You might get that relationship you're longing for, that love you're longing for, but ultimately, where's that love come from? It's not from that, but that person is not the source of that love. All love comes from God. All glory comes from God. Everything that we shape our identity on, our security, our satisfaction, our social status, everything that we're longing for comes from God. God's the source. It changed my life. The next day I got a job. It was the craziest thing. It was like God just like withheld that to teach me that lesson. And then boom, you're a manager at a restaurant now. What are you looking to as a source in your life? What blessings of God, what gifts of God have you exchanged in place of God? And here's another question for you. What happens when the sources fail you? Have you ever had that happen? You put the weight of your expectation on something and then it falls short. Someone else gets that promotion at work. Some, your relationships on the rocks. Politicians lie. Christian leaders fail. Pandemics rip through our world. People say things and do things that wound us or disappoint us and our hopes dim and our hearts hurt. When our world is threatened, how do we respond? I'll tell you how we respond. We have a choice. We can respond by either turning our hearts back to God as the source of life and the giver of gifts, or we can turn our hearts away from him. We can either hail Hosanna and have him sit on the throne of our hearts, or we can cry crucify him and keep looking for our life elsewhere out there in the broken systems that are doomed to fail us over and over because they don't have eyes to see and they don't have ears to hear and they don't have mouths to give us blessings. They are gifts, not God's. You have a temple right in the middle of your life. And there's only room for one God in the center of that temple. And the good news is Jesus, Jesus loves us too much to allow us to continue to worship something that will diminish our lives. Whether it's a false idol we've replaced him with or whether it's a false expectation we've placed upon him. And that's exactly what happens next last portion of scripture, verse 15. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He turned over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. 
but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Key verse 18 here. And when they heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. Jesus walks into the temple. He gets a wild look in his eye and suddenly we see a side of Jesus that we are not used to seeing. This guy who rode up on the symbol of peace and humility yesterday starts turning over tables and driving out the four X traders. It says, what the heck moment with Jesus? It does seem, it does seem a bit extreme, doesn't it? Does it seem that way to you when you hear this story? But we have to understand one more layer of this story for our own good. And that is this, and I hope you hear this. Not only did these people have false expectations of Jesus, not only had they exchanged their relationship with God and turned the temple into an idol, and not only had that religious system begin to corrupt them like the ring corrupted Smeagol, but the result of this was it began to destroy others as well. It was a snowball that started the avalanche of death and destruction because, listen guys, idolatry in the temple not only corrupts our hearts and lives, but idolatry always leads to collateral damage. Jesus said the temple was a place for all nations to come and connect with God, but their corrupt system was destroying their mission and their witness in the world. They ripped people off who came there to worship. They used God to line their pockets and get what they really wanted. They, they sacrificed God's glory and honor for a few dollars in their pocket. In other words, they were raising another flag higher than the Jesus flag. And I want to say this real briefly. We do this too. Whenever... We make something more central than the gospel. Whenever we pull politics or this issue or something else into the center, more than Jesus, and we raise that flag higher, we're doing the same thing, and there's going to be collateral damage in our world that ruins our witness. Here's a cool mathematical formula to your, for you to help you with this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. If you have Jesus plus something, Jesus plus this relationship working out, Jesus plus my temple, Jesus plus whatever, you lose it all. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's why we see this side of Jesus we aren't used to. And how do they respond? Are they, are they excited? We've been talking about revival here. Are they excited about this revival? This grace renewal, Jesus is here. He is cleaning up house, man. This is, this is awesome. No, they wanted to kill him. They were fine with him when they thought he was overthrowing the Romans so that they could have their temple, but they didn't want him to replace their temple. Jesus reveals that their temple was barren. Their religious system was broken. Their, their lives were rooted in false belief and therefore not bearing fruit. They were the fig tree. And Jesus wanted so much more for them. I feel so sorry for them. I mean, think about it. They're holding on to their temple and the God of their temple standing right there next to them. Jesus shows up to help them, not to, not to hurt them. And when he cleanses the temple and their worldview is threatened and their idolatry is challenged and their expectations of him are flipped upside down, when their functional savior is threatened, they kill their true savior. And a few days later, that's exactly what happens. They bring Jesus before the authorities. Those who shouted crown him, shouted crucify him. Those who yelled Hosanna are now hollering out all these slurs and hateful lies. What can turn people who say they love and worship God into people who want to silence their Savior? I'll tell you what I see in the story of Palm Sunday. When we have the wrong expectations of Jesus and we feel let down by his plan. Or when he comes to free our hearts from false gods that we've replaced him with and we don't want to let him go. Or when he shows us how fruitless our lives are when they're rooted in something less than him. And we say, no, I like where I'm rooted. 
And I've been guilty of every one of these things over and over in my life. I've, this past year, I've hurled accusations at God and crushed him under the weight of my false expectations. I've sought to silence my savior when he threatened my idols. I'm, I'm right now, I'm, if you hear me being passionate, it's because I'm preaching to me. And here's what I need to hear today. And here's what I want you to hear today. If you hear nothing else, when Jesus comes bringing Bar Jesus, when Jesus comes barging into your life with that wild look in his eyes, it's not because he wants to destroy your life, but because he wants to save it. He isn't furious with anger against you. He's furious with longing and love for you. Jesus is riding towards the temple at the center of your life right now in peace and humility to courageously do the work that you and I could never do on our own to set you free, to break the chains that bind you up and strangle your life's purpose, to loose you from the broken patterns of self-slavery and addiction that deteriorate your soul, to, to cleanse out the temple of your life. And sometimes he graciously challenges your idols and he uses all kinds of things, including trials and temptations to detach our hearts from the false loves that we pursue in his place. Remember what the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chases. Let me ask you a question as we run down. Do you, do you see God's love when it shows up as loving correction? Do you see his loving correction as good news? When Jesus shows up at the temple of your life and starts turning over tables, what's your heart response? Are you frustrated? Angry with God? Resentful? Confused? Are you thankful and penitent and worshipful? And as you hear this today, I don't know how it sounds to you, if it sounds like bad news or if it sounds like good news, but I wanna give you a glimpse into the good news just one more time as we close here. Let's end where we began at the center of this chapter, this, this, this fig tree, right in the middle of the chapter. It's, we are the fig tree. That's the mystery of this chapter that helps us understand the whole thing. That unfruitful fig tree is a perfect picture of you and I without Christ. Life becomes unfruitful and unfulfilling. Remember what Jesus said? Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. So many of us don't, we live not abiding in him. And those idols we chase leave us empty and longing for more. And we're hopeless and dead in our sins and living dried up from the roots searching desperately for something. But there is hope today. Because this fig tree, even though it's the center of the chapter, it is not the center of the story. This chapter is part of a larger story and there's another tree right in the middle of that story and the, there's good news, the embodiment of the gospel hanging on that tree soaked in blood cursed by man and God, beaten and broken and killed in our place. He became sin, who knew no sin so that we might become the very righteousness of God. Yes, we're like that fig tree apart from Christ's work, but, but what was his work? That's what this week's about, Holy Week. As we head towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday and we take time to remember that first, Jesus Christ lived a life full of fruitfulness on our behalf. And then he took the curse for me. He was cut off so that you and I could be brought in. He became unfruitful, dead and dried up from the roots so that you and I could live lives full of fruit, made alive by the Holy Spirit, rooted in the truth of the gospel. Like today, because of his work, you can become a blessing to everyone around you. Your heart can become a picture of what the temple was meant to be. A place of light and holiness and good news where the presence of God dwells by the power of the Holy Spirit and connects with a broken, hurting world all around you. A place free from idols, cleansed from addictions and, and false loves. Jesus took on the weight of your idolatry so that we could be free to place God back in the center once again. And today, if you, you can trust that if you let him into your temple, he will graciously drive out the things that would otherwise destroy you. 
if you crown him king today for the first time or maybe the 500th time, you will experience abundant life. God is freeing you from the tyranny of self-rule and calling you to trust him. But what's the cry of your heart today? As we close, is the cry of your heart Hosanna? Or who does he think he is? Will you enthrone him or reject him? Will you crown him or crucify him? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the good news that shows up on that first Palm Sunday. That you loved us right where we're at in the middle of our mess. But you love us too much to leave us there. That you love us so much that you gave yourself to set us free. You became dried up and broken so that I could live a life of fruitfulness and wholeness. And as we take communion today, remember that, God. I pray that as we take that bread into our mouth, we would remember that it represents the perfect life you lived every day in your flesh, a fruitful, righteous, holy life, pure. And that that righteousness is now ours. We become the righteousness of God because you became our sin. And that juice, the wine, represents the blood that was poured out on the cross to forgive us of our sins because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And today we can stand here, even, even in a moment where we realize our lives are full of idolatry, in a moment where the music around us is drowning out the good news of your grace. In moments like this, when we might feel overwhelmed with our own brokenness as we look in the mirror and the fickleness of our heart and the false expectations we put on you, we know that we can stand forgiven and whole and made right as your sons and daughters, not because we are so perfect or because we have our stuff together so well, but because you did and you loved us and you gave everything for us, God. So draw us to you again today to remember the gospel. And let that gospel free our hearts from the lesser things that it beats for sometimes. Holy Spirit, move in us, move in our lives, move in our marriages, move in our homes, move in our church, move in our mission. God. Free us to, to follow you unashamedly, God. To be what the temple was meant to be, a place where people could come from a broken and hurting world and experience you. Fill us up, God, to where when they encounter us, they encounter you and your grace and your goodness and your love. Have your way in us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So we're going to respond by singing and taking communion and praying. We've got some people in the back that would love to pray for you. Today, maybe as you hear this, you're like, you know, I've never really trusted that gospel. I've never heard the gospel in that way. And I really want to, I want to give God my all come back and get prayer or maybe you've got things in your life that idolatry and you want to be freed from it come back and get prayer maybe you just don't even know what you need but you know you need prayer come back and get prayer we're going to sing together and take communion i uh, love you guys and uh yeah let's spend a little bit of time allowing the holy spirit to speak to us maybe sitting in silence and saying god what do you want to say to me what, what do you want to do in my life right now is there something you're calling me to do in response here in Jesus' name.
more than anything that you can do I just want you And I'm sorry When I just gone through the motions I'm sorry I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry and I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment Never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, Jesus, you don't know just want you I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Sing with me Nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. We just, we just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. We just want you. Nothing else, nothing else. Just for you, we just want you, God. We just want you, God. We just want you. We just want. Just wanna sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment. I never wanna leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings, Jesus. You don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I just want you. I just want you.
just want you Oh, I just want you song really speaks to that message that has just preached. And I search the world and it couldn't feel me Man's empty praise the treasures that fade are never enough came along put me back together every desire is now satisfied you in your love you sing there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you there's
Hey everyone, I'm going to share a verse for you guys. Um, but before I do, I just want one more time to remind you guys, uh, we do need an RSVP if you're planning on coming to Good Friday, so you can do that right at the welcome table there. And uh, so this verse that I'm about to share, you probably heard before, but uh, my favorite um, explanation of this verse is, is explaining the word living sacrifice. And a lot of times you may have heard this verse, I'm going to read it and then I'll read it and explain it and then I'll read it again. So it is uh, Romans 12, 1, it says, and this is my favorite version uh, as far as translation goes, it's beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? To surrender yourselves to God and be his sacred living sacrifices um, and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Um, so in that living sacrifice, I think a lot of times we think about giving God something that maybe we don't want to give God, um, give up our sin and do those kind of things. But I kind of like thinking of it through the lens of what do I have to give God that is living? Um, I don't want to give him my sin because my sin is dead. It never brought me life. It only kills me. And God doesn't necessarily want that from me, even though he wants me to surrender my sin. But what he wants from me is a living sacrifice. So if God has given his son to be in, the, in my body as his temple. What he wants in return is the expression of his son in and out and through me. That is a living sacrifice to give God in return himself, that I would live out his spirit, that I would say his words, that I'd walk in his direction as he is leading me. So I'm going to read it again through that light. It says, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? To, surren to surrender yourselves to God and be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights God's heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful um, and hopefully a wonderful day and hopefully see you guys Good Friday and Easter. Exciting times. Love you guys. Bye.